evening, and welcome to Dr. Peace Theater. My name is Dr. Dennis Business, and tonight, tonight we will continue our dive into the second of the short stories contained within the pages of the Bachman books. The Long Walk. When we last left Ray Garrity and our friends on the road, 49 of them have bought a ticket so far, leaving 50 boys left. They have been walking for approximately a day and a half and are approaching Old Town. And that is where we pick up our story today. There was no sunset as they walked into their second night on the road. The rainstorm gave way to a light, chilling drizzle around 4.30. The drizzle continued on until almost 8 o'clock. Then the clouds began to break up and show bright, coldly flickering stars. Garrity pulled himself closer together inside his damp clothes and did not need a weatherman to know which way the wind blew. Fickle spring had pulled the balmy warmth that had come with them this far from underneath them like an old rug. Maybe the crowds provided some warmth, radiant heat or something. More and more of them lined the road. They were huddled together for warmth, but were undemonstrative. They watched the walkers go past, and then went home, or hurried on to the next vantage point. If it was blood the crowds were looking for, they hadn't gotten much of it, they had only lost two since Jensen, both of them younger boys who had simply fainted dead away. That put them exactly halfway. No, really more than that. Fifty down, forty-nine to go. Garrity was walking by himself. He was too cold to be sleepy. His lips were pressed together to keep the tremble out of them. Olsen was still back there. Half-hearted bets had gone around to the effect that Olsen would be the 50th to buy a ticket. The halfway boy. But he hadn't. That signal honor had gone to number 13, Roger Fenham. Unlucky old 13. Garrity was beginning to think that Olsen would go on indefinitely. Maybe until he starved to death. He had locked himself away in a place beyond pain. In a way, he supposed... It would be poetic justice if Olsen won. He could see the headlines. Long walk won by dead man. Garrity's toes were numb. He wiggled them against the shredded inner linings of his shoes and could feel nothing. The real pain was not in his toes now. It was in his arches. A sharp, blatting pain that knifed up into his calves each time he took a step. It made him think of a story his mother had read him when he was small. It was about a mermaid who wanted to be a woman. Only she had a tail, and a good fairy or someone said she could have legs if she wanted them badly enough. Every step she took on dry land would be like walking on knives. But she could have them if she wanted them. And she said, yeah, okay, and that was the long walk. In a nutshell, warning, warning 47, I hear ya. Garrity snapped crossly and picked up his feet. The woods were thinner. The real northern part of the state was behind them. They had gone through two quietly residential towns, the road cutting them lengthwise, and the sidewalks packed with people that were little more than shadows beneath the drizzle diffused street lamps. No one cheered much. It was too cold, he supposed. Too cold and too dark, and Jesus Christ... Now he had another warning to walk off, and if that wasn't a royal pisser, nothing was. His feet were slowing again, and he forced himself to pick them up. Somewhere quite far up ahead, Barkovich said something and followed it up with a short burst of his unpleasant laughter. He could hear McVree's response clearly. Shut up, killer. 
Barkovich told McFreeze to go to hell. And now he seemed quite upset by the whole thing. Garrity smiled wanly in the darkness. He had dropped back, almost to the tail of the column, and reluctantly realized he was angling towards Stebbins again. Something about Stebbins fascinated him, but he decided he didn't particularly care what that something was. It was time to give up wondering about things. There was just no percentage in it. It was just another royal pisser. There was a huge, luminescent arrow ahead in the dark. It glowed like an evil spirit. Suddenly a brass band struck up a march, a good-sized band by the sound. There were louder cheers. The air was full of drifting fragments, and for a crazy moment Garrity thought it was snowing. But it wasn't snow. It was confetti. They were changing roads. The old one met the new one at a right angle, and another main turnpike sign announced that Old Town was now a mere 16 miles away. Garrity felt a tentative feeler of excitement, maybe even pride. After Old Town, he knew the route. He could have traced it on the palm of his hand. Maybe it's your edge. I don't think so, but maybe it is. Garrity jumped. It was as if Stebbins had pried the lid off his mind and peeked down inside. What? It's your country, isn't it? Not up here. I've never been north of Greenbush in my life, except when we drove up to the marker. And we didn't come this way. They left the brass band behind them, its tubas and clarinets glistening softly in the moist night. But we do go through your hometown, don't we? No, but close by it. Stebbins grunted. Garrity looked down at Stebbins' feet and saw with surprise that Stebbins had removed his tennis shoes and was wearing a pair of soft-looking moccasins. His shoes were tucked into his shirt. I'm saving the tennis shoes, Stebbins said, just in case, but I think the mocks will finish it off. Oh. They passed a radio tower standing skeletal in an empty field. A red light pulsed as regular as a heartbeat at its tip. Looking forward to seeing your loved ones? Yes, I am, Garrity said. What happens after that? Happens? Garrity shrugged. Keep on walking down the road, I guess. Unless you were all considerate enough to buy out by then. Oh, I don't think so, Stebbin said, smiling. Are you sure you won't be walked out? After you see them? Man, I'm not sure of anything, Garrity said. I didn't know much when I started, and I know less now. You think you have a chance? I don't know that either. I don't even know why I bother talking to you. It's like talking to smoke. Far ahead, police sirens howled and gobbled in the night. Somebody broke through the road up ahead where the police are spread thinner, Stebbins said. The natives are getting restless, Garrity. Just think of all the people diligently making way for you up ahead for you too. Me too, Stebbins agreed, then didn't say anything for a long time. The collar of his Chambray work shirt flapped vacuously against his neck. It's amazing how the mind operates the body, he said at last. It's amazing how it can take over and dictate to your body. Your average housewife may walk up to 16 miles a day from icebox to ironing board to clothesline. She's ready to put her feet up at the end of the day, but she's not exhausted. A door-to-door -door salesman might do 20. A high school kid in training for football walks 25 to 28. That's in one day from getting up in the morning to going to bed at night. All of them get tired, but none of them get exhausted. Yeah, but suppose you told the housewife, today you must watch 16 miles before you can have your supper. Garrity nodded. She'd be exhausted instead of tired. Stebbin said nothing. Garrity had the perverse feeling that Stebbins was disappointed in him. Well, wouldn't she? Don't you think she'd have her 16 miles in by noon so she could kick off her shoes and spend the afternoon watching the soaps? I do. Are you tired, Garrity? Yeah, Garrity said shortly, I'm tired. Exhausted? Well, I'm getting there. No, 
You're not getting exhausted yet, Garrity. He jerked a thumb at Olsen's silhouette. That's exhausted. He's almost through now. Garrity watched Olsen, fascinated, almost expecting him to drop at Stebbins' word. What are you driving at? Ask your cracker friend, Art Baker. A mule doesn't like to plow, but he likes carrots, so you hang a carrot in front of his eyes. A mule without a carrot gets exhausted. A mule with a carrot spends a long time being tired. Do you get it? No. Stebbin smiled again. You will. Watch Olson. He's lost his appetite for the carrot. He doesn't quite know it yet, but he has. Watch Olson, Garrity. You can learn from Olson. Garrity looked at Stebbins closely, not sure how seriously to take him. Stebbins laughed aloud. His laugh was rich and full, a startling sound that made other walkers turn their heads. Go on. Go talk to him, Garrity. And if you won't talk, just get up close and have a good look. It's never too late to learn. Garrity swallowed. Is it a very important lesson, would you say? Stebbin stopped laughing. He caught Garrity's wrist in a strong grip. The most important lesson you'll ever learn, maybe, the secret of life over death. Reduce that equation and you can afford to die, Garrity. You can spend your life like a drunkard on a spree. Stebbins dropped his hand. Garrity massaged his wrist slowly. Stebbins seemed to have dismissed him again. Nervously, Garrity walked away from him and towards Olson. It seemed to Garrity that he was drawn towards Olson on an invisible wire. He flanked him at four o'clock. He tried to fathom Olson's face. Once, a long time ago, he had been frightened into a long night of wakefulness by a movie starring who? It had been Robert Mitchum, hadn't it? He had been playing the part of a Southern Revival minister who had also been a compulsive murderer. In silhouette, Olson looked a little bit like him now. His form had seemed to elongate as the weight slewed off him. His skin had gone scaly with dehydration. His eyes had sunk into hollowed sockets. His hair flew aimlessly on his skull like wind-driven corn silk. Why, he's nothing but a robot. Nothing but an automation, really. Can there still be an Olsen in there hiding? No. He's gone. I am quite sure that the Olsen who sat on the grass and joked and told about the kid who froze on the starting line and bought his ticket right there. That Olsen is gone. This is a dead clay thing. Olsen? He whispered. Olsen walked on. He was a shambling haunted house on legs. Olsen had fouled himself. Olsen smelled bad. Olsen, can you talk? Olsen swept onward. His face was turned into the darkness, and he was moving. Yes, he was moving. Something was going on here. Something was still ticking over, but... Something. Yes, there was something. But what? They breasted another rise. The breath came shorter and shorter in Garrity's lungs until he was panting like a dog. Tiny vapors of steam rose from his wet clothes. There was a river below them, lying in the dark like a silver snake. The still water, he imagined. The still water passed near Old Town. A few half-hearted cheers went up, but not many. Further on, nestled against the far side of the river's dog leg, was a nestle of lights. Old Town. A smaller nestle of lights on the other side would be Milford and Bradley. Old Town. They had made it to Old Town. Olson, he said. There's Old Town. Those lights are Old Town. We're getting there, fella. Olson made no answer, and now he could remember what had been eluding him, and it was nothing so vital after all, just that Olson reminded him of the Flying Dutchman, sailing on and on after the whole crew had disappeared. They walked rapidly down the long hill, passed through an S-curve, and crossed a bridge that spanned, according to the sign, Meadow Brook. 
On the far side of this ridge was another Steep Hill Trucks Use Low Gear sign. There were groans from some of the walkers. It was indeed a steep hill. It seemed to rise above them like a toboggan slide. It was not long. Even in the dark they could see the summit, but it was steep all right. Plenty steep. They started up. Garrity leaned into the slope, feeling his grip on his respiration start to trickle away, almost at once. Be panting like a dog at the top, he thought, and then thought, if I get to the top. There was a protesting clamor rising in both legs. It started in his thighs and worked its way down. His legs were screaming at him that they simply weren't going to do this shit any longer. But you will, Garrity told them. You will or you'll die. I don't care, his legs answered back. I don't care if I do die. Do die. Do die. The muscles seemed to be softening, melting like jello left out in a hot sun. They trembled almost helplessly. They twitched like badly controlled puppets. Warnings cracked out right and left, and Garrity realized he would be getting one for his very own soon enough. He kept his eyes fixed on Olson, forcing himself to match his pace to Olson's. They would make it together, up over the top of this killer hill, and then he would get Olson to tell him his secret. Then everything would be Jake, and he wouldn't have to worry about Stebbins or McBreeze or Jan or his father. No, not even about Freaky Delicio, who had spread his head on a stone wall beside US-1, like a dollop of glue. What was it? A hundred feet on? Fifty? What? Now he was panting. The first gunshots rang out. There was a loud, yipping scream that was drowned by more gunshots. And at the brow of the hill, they got one more. Garrity could see nothing in the dark. His tortured pulse hammered in his temples. He found that he didn't give a fuck who had bought it this time. It didn't matter. Only the pain mattered. The tearing pain in his legs and lungs. The hill rounded, flattened, and rounded still more on the downslope. The far side was gently sloping, perfect for regaining wind. But that soft jelly feeling in his muscles didn't want to leave. My legs are going to collapse, Garrity thought calmly. They'll never take me as far as Freeport. I don't think I can make it to Old Town. I'm dying, I think. A sound began to beat its way into the night then, savage and orgiastic. It was a voice. It was many voices. And it was repeating the same thing over and over. Garrity. Garrity. Guarantee, guarantee. It was God or his father, about to cut the legs out from under him before he can learn the secret. The secret. The secret of, like thunder now, guarantee, guarantee, guarantee. It wasn't his father, and it wasn't God. It was what appeared to be the entire student body of Old Town High School, chanting him... It wasn't his father, and it wasn't God. Slow down in three. It wasn't his father, and it wasn't God. It was what appeared to be the entire student body of Old Town High School, chanting his name in unison. As they caught sight of his white, weary, and strained face, the steady beating cry dissolved into wild cheering. Cheerleaders fluttered pom-poms. Boys whistled shrilly and kissed their girls. Garrity waved back, smiled, nodded and craftily crept closer to Olson. Olson, he whispered. Olson. Olson's eyes might have flickered a tiny bit. A spark of life, the single turn of an old starter in a junked Oldsmobile. Tell me how, Olson, he whispered. Tell me what to do. The high school girls and boys. Did I once go to high school, Garrity wondered. Was that a dream? They were behind them now, still cheering uproariously. Olson's eyes moved jerkily in their sockets, as if long rusted and in need of oil. His mouth fell open with a nearly audible clunk. That's it, Garrity whispered eagerly. Talk. Talk to me, Olson. Tell me. Tell me. 
uh, Olson said. Uh, uh, Garrity moved even closer. He put a hand on Olson's shoulder and leaned into an evil nimbus of sweat, halitosis, and urine. Please, Garrity said, try hard. Gah. Goo. God. God's garden. God's garden, Garrity repeated doubtfully. What about God's garden, Olson? It's full of weeds, Olson said sadly. His head bounced against his chest. I... Garrity said nothing. He could not. They were going up another hill now, and he was panting again. Olson didn't seem to be out of breath at all. I don't want to die, Olson finished. Garrity's eyes were soldered to the shadowed ruin that was Olson's face. Olson turned creakily towards him. Ah? Olson raised his lolling head slowly. Ga, ga, Garrity? Yes, it's me. What time is it? Garrity had rewound and reset his watch earlier. God knew why. It's a quarter of nine. No. No later. Than that? Mild surprise watched over Olson's shattered old man's face. Olson! He shook Olson's shoulder gently, and Olson's whole frame seemed to tremble like a gantry in high wind. What's it all about? Suddenly Garrity cackled madly. What's it all about, Alfie? Olson looked at Garrity with calculated shrewdness. Garrity, he whispered. His breath was like a sewer drought. What? What time is it? Damn it! Garrity shouted at him. He turned his head quickly, but Stebbins was staring down at the road. If he was laughing at Garrity, it was too dark to see. Garrity? What? Garrity said even more quietly. Gee, Jesus will save you. Olson's head came all the way up. He began to walk off the road. He was walking at the half track. Warning! Warning 70! Olson never slowed. There was a ruinous dignity about him. The gabble of the crowd quieted. They watched, wide-eyed. Olson never hesitated. He reached the soft shoulder and put his hands over the side of the half track. He began to clamber painfully up the side. Olson! Abraham yelled, startled. Hey, that's Hank Olson! The soldiers brought their guns around in perfect four-part harmony. Olson grabbed the barrel of the closest and yanked it out of the hands that held it as if it had been an ice cream stick. It clattered off into the crowd. They shrank from it, screaming as if it had been a live adder. Then one of the other three guns went off. Garrity saw the flash at the end of the barrel quite clearly. He saw the jerky ripple of Olson's shirt as the bullet entered his belly and then punched out the back. Olson did not stop. He gained the top of the half track and grabbed the barrel of the gun that had just shot him. He levered it up into the air as it went off again. Get him! McVries was screaming savagely up ahead. Get him, Olsen! Kill him! Kill him! The other two guns roared in unison, and the impact of the heavy caliber slugs sent Olsen flying off the half track. He landed spread-eagled on his back like a man nailed to a cross. One side of his belly was a black and shredded ruin. Three more bullets were pumped into him. The guard Olsen disarmed had produced another carbine effortlessly from inside the half-track. Olsen sat up. He put his hands against his belly, stared calmly at the poised soldiers on the deck of the squad vehicle. The soldiers stared back. You bastards! McVries sobbed. You bloody bastards! Olsen began to get up. Another volley of bullets drove him flat again. Now there was a sound from behind Garrity. He didn't have to turn his head to know it was Stebbins. 
Stebbins was laughing softly. Olsen sat up again. The guns were still trained on him, but the soldiers did not shoot. Their silhouettes on the half-track seemed to indicate curiosity. Slowly, reflectively, Olsen gained his feet, hands crossed on his belly. He seemed to sniff the air for direction, turned slowly in the direction of the walk, and began to stagger along. Put him out of it! A shocked voice screamed hoarsely, For Christ's sake, put him out of it! The blue snakes of Olsen's intestines were slowly slipping through his fingers. They dropped like link sausages against his groin, where they flapped obscenely. He stopped, bent over as if to retrieve them. Retrieve them, Garrity thought in a near ecstasy of wonder and horror and threw up a huge glut of blood and bile. He began to walk again, bent over. His face was sweetly calm. Oh my God, Abraham said and turned to Garrity with his hands cuffed over his mouth. Abraham's face was white and cheesy. His eyes were bulging. His eyes were frantic with terror. Oh my God, Ray, what a fucking gross out, oh Jesus. Abraham vomited. Puke sprayed through his fingers. Well, old Abe has tossed his cookies, Garrity thought remotely. That's no way to observe Hint 13, Abe. They gut shot him, Stebbins said from behind Garrity. They'll do that. It's deliberate. To discourage anyone else from trying the old charge of the light brigade number. Get away from me, Garrity hissed, or I'll knock your block off. Stebbins dropped back quickly. Warning! Warning 88! Stebbins' laugh drifted softly to him. Olsen went to his knees. His head hung between his arms, which were propped up on the road. One of the rifles roared, and a bullet clipped asphalt beside Olsen's left hand and whined away. He began to climb slowly, wearily, to his feet again. They're playing with him, Garrity thought. All of this must be terribly boring for them. So they're playing with Olsen. Is Olsen fun, boys? Is Olsen keeping you amused? Garrity began to cry. He ran over to Olsen and fell on his knees beside him and held the tired, hectically hot face against his chest. He sobbed into the dry, bad-smelling hair. Warning! Warning 47! Warning! Warning 61! McVries was pulling at him. It was McVries again. Get up, Ray! Ray, get up. You can't help him. For God's sake, get up. It's not fair. Garrity wept. There was a stickly smear of Olsen's blood on his cheekbone. It's just not fair. I know. Come on. Come on. Garrity stood up. He and McVries began walking backward rapidly, watching Olsen, who was on his knees. Olsen got to his feet. He stood astride the white line. He raised both hands up into the sky. The crowd sighed softly. I did it wrong! Olsen shouted tremblingly and then fell flat and dead. The soldiers on the half track put another two bullets in him and then dragged him busily off the road. Yes, that's that. They walked quietly for ten minutes or so, Garrity drawing a low-key comfort just from McVree's presence. I'm starting to see something in it, Pete, he said at last. There's a pattern. It isn't all senseless. Yeah? Don't count on it. He talked to me, Pete. He wasn't dead until they shot him. He was alive. Now it seemed that was the most important thing about the Olsen experience. He repeated it, alive. I don't think it makes any difference, McVries said with a tired sigh. He's just a number, part of the body count, number 53. It means we're a little closer, and that's all it means. You don't really think that. Don't tell me what I think and what I don't, McVries said crossly. Leave it alone, can't you? I put us about 13 miles outside of Old Town. Garrity said, well, hot shit! 
Do you know how Scram is? I'm not his doctor. Why don't you Scram yourself? What the hell is eating you? McVries laughed wildly. Here we are. Here we are. And you want to know what's eating me. I'm worried about next year's income taxes. That's what's eating me. I'm worried about the price of grain in South Dakota. That's what's eating me. Olson, his guts were falling out, Garrity. At the end, he was walking with his guts falling out. And that's what's eating me. That's what's eating me. He broke off, and Garrity watched him struggle to keep from vomiting. Abruptly, McBreeze said, Scram's poor. Is he? Collie Parker felt his forehead and said he was burning up. He's talking funny. About his wife, about Phoenix, Flagstaff, weird stuff about the Hopis and the Navajos and the Kachka dolls. It's hard to make out. How much longer can he go? Who can say? He might outlast us all. He's built like a buffalo and he's trying awful hard. Jesus, am I tired. What about Barkovich? He's wising up. He knows a lot of us will be glad to see him buy a ticket to see the farm. He's made up his mind to outlast me, the nasty little fucker. He doesn't like me nagging him. Tough shit, right? I know. McVries uttered his wild laugh again. Garrity didn't like the sound of it. He's scared, though. He's easing up on the lung power and going to leg power. <laughs> we all are. Yeah, old town coming up. Thirteen miles. That's right. Can I say something to you, Garrity? Sure. I suppose I'll carry it with me to the grave. I suppose that's true. Someone near the front of the crowd set off a firecracker and both Garrity and McVries jumped. Several women screeched. A burly man in the front row said, God damn it! Through a mouthful of popcorn. The reason all of this is so horrible, McVries said, is because it's just trivial, you know? We've sold ourselves and traded our souls on trivialities. Olson, he was trivial. He was magnificent, too. But those things aren't mutually exclusive. He was magnificent and trivial. Either way, or both. He died like a bug under the microscope. You're as bad as Stebbins, Garrity said resentfully. I wish Priscilla had killed me, McVree said. At least it wouldn't have been... Trivial, Garrity finished. Yeah, I think, look, I want to doze a little if I can. Do you mind? No, I, I'm sorry. McVree sounded stiff and offended. I'm sorry, Garrity said. Look, don't take it to heart. It's really trivial. McVree's finished. He laughed his wild laugh for the third time and walked away. Garrity wished, not for the first time that he had made no friends on the long walk. It was going to make it hard, in fact. It was already hard. There was a sluggish stirring in his bowels. Soon, they would have to be emptied. The thought made him grind his mental teeth. People would point and laugh. He would drop his shit in the street like a mongrel hound, and afterward people would gather it up in paper napkins and put it in bottles for souvenirs. It seemed impossible that people would do such things. But he knew it happened. Olsen with his guts falling out. McVries and Priscilla in the pajama factory. Scram, glowing fever bright. Abraham, what price stovepipe hat, audience? Garrity's head dropped. He dozed. The walk went on. Over hill, over dale over stile and mountain, over ridge and under bridge, and past my lady's fountain. Garrity giggled in the dimming recesses of his brain. His feet pounded the pavement and the loose heel flapped looser, like an old shutter on a dead house. I think, therefore I am. First year Latin class, old tunes in a dead language, ding dong bell pussies down the well. Who pushed her in? little Jackie Flynn. I exist. Therefore, I am. Another firecracker went off. There were whoops and cheers. The half-track ground and clattered, and Garrity listened for the sound of his number and a warning, and then dozed deeper. 
Daddy, I wasn't glad when you had to go, but I never really missed you when you were gone. Sorry, but that's not the reason I'm here. I have no subconscious urge to kill myself. Sorry, Stebbins. So sorry, but... The guns again. Startling him awake, and there was the familiar nail sack thud of another boy going home to Jesus. The crowd screamed its horror and roared its approval. Garrity! A woman squealed. Ray Garrity! Her voice was harsh and scabbed. We're with you, boy! We're with you, Ray! Her voice cut through the crowds and heads turned, necks craned, so that they could get a better look at Maine's own. There were scattered boos drowned in a rising cheer. The crowd took up the chant again. Garrity heard his name until it was reduced to a jumble of nonsense syllables that had nothing to do with him. He waved briefly and dozed again. That was chapter 10 of The Long Walk, the second short story contained within the pages of the Bachman books. We have lost Olson. We have lost him in a most terrible way, with his intestines falling out in front of him. I think that'll mess with whoever wins for a long time. I think it's one thing to go. It's another thing to go like that. And the boys have now hit the interstate and are approaching Old Town. They're going to be flanked by crowds from here on in. But we'll talk about that next time. Because this has been Dr. Peace Theater. My name is Dr. Dennis Business. And as always, my friends.